Shabbat Shalom to everyone. May you be blessed mightily today and may the Word of God do a wonderful work in your life. Now, before we get onto the Word, let us bow our heads with an opening prayer. Dear loving and heavenly Father, as we deal to you, humbly acknowledge of your greatness. Let it be all done not in human might, Lord, not in human power, but by your Spirit. Let every ear be open to hear and listen to what your Spirit is saying. Let our eyes be open to the things of your Spirit, so that we may understand what you want to reveal to us today. And open our hearts, Lord, so that we may be fully submerged in your love as you speak. Just like Paul prayed for love to overflow in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, let us pray these scriptures in a personal way. Lord, we humbly kneel in all before your Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And we pray that you would unveil within us the unlimited riches of your glory and favor until supernatural strength floods our innermost being with your divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using our faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of us and the resting place of Christ, love, will become the very source and root of our lives. Then we will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experienced, the great magnitude, magnitude of astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is the love of God. Endless love beyond measure that transcends our understanding and our knowledge. This extravagant love pour into us until we are filled to overflow with the fullness of God. Never doubting God's mighty power to work in us and accomplish all this. You will achieve infinitely more than our greatest request, Lord, our most unbelievable dreams, and exceed our wildest imagination. You will outdo them all to your miraculous power constantly energizing us. Father, we ask you all this in the precious name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Oh, praise the Lord God Almighty. Well, today, the word that the Lord gave me is arise of God and let our enemies be scattered. How many of us know that the believers have enemies? Yes, the arch enemy being Satan. So today the Lord took me to the scriptures, amazing scriptures in the book of Jude. So let us open the book of Jude. It's only one chapter, verse 1. Let's read verse 1 and 2. I will read to you. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and brother of James, writes this letter to those who are called chosen. Dear loved by God, the Father, and separate, set apart, consecrated, and kept for Jesus. Verse 2, may mercy, soul peace, and love be multiplied unto you. 
how humble the nature of Jude or Judah by him not using he is natural relation as half brother of Jesus but lift Jesus up far above that relationship and call himself his servant and only reself re, you know, makes himself related to James which is his other brother what an amazing humility lifting up Jesus Christ way above himself and his relationship as half-brother. Let's look at verse 3. Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regards to our common salvation. That's what he was doing. But I found it necessary and I was impelled to write to you an urgent appeal and exhort you to contend for the faith contend for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints the faith which is the sum of Christian belief which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God by the apostles so what is contending to the faith we know that Jude was talking to all the saints of his era. What does this have to do with us? More than ever before, in these times, end times, we are called to contend for our faith. Meaning to repeatedly participate fully and wholeheartedly in the race course that was set before us. We are all running a race, like Paul said, even before. We are all running a race. And we want to run a good race. For that, we must contend with the faith. We must continue participating and entering into that race without giving up. Let's look at verse 4. For certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining entrance secretly by the side door. And we'll keep on reading, but before we keep on reading, I want to bring this forth. So why are we contending for our faith? Because certain men, as verse 4 says, have crept in, gaining entrance secretly through the side door, not through the entrance door. Their doom was predicted long ago ungodly, profane persons who perverted the grace of God, the spiritual blessing and favor of a living God into a license to commit lawlessness, wantonness, immorality, and disown and deny our soul master Jesus, Christ the Anointed One. So what is what is the Lord saying through the scriptures? He's telling us to, to contend, continuously contend for our faith. Keep our faith by continuously participating in this race of holiness. Because these people have entered in to our ministry, to our churches, to our families, to our nation bringing deprivation and these people are predicted in the word of God being doomed forever because they are profane they are impious people and the perfect the grace of God that was given to mankind to walk in holiness as a license to commit immorality Let's look also in the book of Acts in chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 29 and 30 also speaks of this kind of people that have entered in the congregations, the churches, the society, 
And we see how they have perverted the holiness and righteousness that is supposed to rule and reign, that wonderful peace of God's glory into the body of Christ. And much evil has resulted from that. In Acts 20 verse 29 says, I know that after I am gone, this is the prophet, ferocious wolves will get in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30, even from among you, your own selves, men will come to the front, who by saying perverse things, distorted and corrupt things, will endeavor to draw the immature to themselves, to their ministry, to their own party, not to Jesus. So this is the sign. Whenever you see somebody trying to gather out the immature, the people that cannot yet discern because they are new in the things of God and new in the Word of God, trying to gather them onto themselves, they are removing them from looking upon Jesus. That is the sign. The immorality is also their immorality that that grace of God being used for license for immorality, saying God is full of grace, God always forgives, God understands. No, the grace of God is not a license to sin and immorality. The grace of God is an empowerment, empowerment for the believer to walk in holy lives. And it is written in the chapter 2 of Titus, verse 11 and 12, and it says this, For the grace of God, His unmerited blessing and favor, has come forward for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation of mankind. Jesus, Jesus came with grace. Jesus brought grace for us to be saved. But in verse 12 says, It has trained us to reject and renounce all ungodliness and worldly passionate desires, to live discreetly, temperate and self-controlled, upright, devout spiritually, lives in the present world, and in holiness. So here we have that the very grace of God through the word trains us to reject ungodliness, the, the unrefrained passions of the carnality of man, of, of a soul that has not yet been changed. So God makes it very clear in these scriptures that there are those that are using His grace for their evil purposes and to justify their wrongdoings and using it as a license to sin, but it's not so. So today, let us expose that. And why is God talking? You know, let me bring this up that has been in my heart even before we started it. A few Shabbats ago, a few Saturdays ago, the Lord gave us Ezekiel 22, which was God's judgment pronounced or God's assessment from the courts of heaven on the behavior of the nation, lest, lest the nation be punished without repentance. So God's grace, Grace indeed brought this scripture of assessment, which is judgment upon our behavior as a nation, that we may be able to repent. And so if not, then the judgment of punishment will come. After that, the Lord gave us Ezekiel 16, which is a judgment to the body of Christ. God is looking 
into the behavior of the body of Christ, the church, and assessing it and declaring it. So the body of Christ finally, convicted by the Holy Spirit, will repent and reject those behaviors and be reconciled with God because God is always ready to forgive upon repentance. But I, I sense that today God is giving us the book of Jude for individual lives, for individual people, believers, to understand what the unre unregenerated carnality of man will cause men to lean on doing the things that are described here. So as believers, God is giving us the grace, the favor and the blessing to fight, to fight for our faith, to keep our faith alive, to keep our faith strong so we can be trained to reject all that is evil, all that is passionate and godliness, all that is worldliness, all the things that the world and humanism teaches mankind to do, all the immorality and wantonness and greed. God is calling us to love his word, to take on his grace and train by contending and fighting for a faith that we may not fall into carnality as it was before we came to know him. So that is the love of God. That is the amazing, amazing, unsearchable love of God for mankind and for us individually. So I like us to allow the words that we are hearing and reading as being the very words coming out of the mouth of God, not the opinion of man, not, not the mouth of a woman, but God himself talking to our hearts and exposing things, tendencies, desires, passions that have been unbridled, that have been uh, uh, um, loose in our lives. And allow these words to bring forth an acknowledgement of God's goodness and love for us. And bring ourselves bowing down with our hearts before the Lord that He may restore us upon repentance. We must not be blinded with deception of thinking that we are okay singing hallelujah on the way to hell. We want to make sure that God's reveal our condition of heart. Amen. So let's look at verse 5 in Jude chapter 1. Now I want to remind you, he says, though you were fully informed once for all, that though the Lord at one time delivered the people out of the land of Egypt, Subsequently, he destroyed those of them who did not believe at the end. So, once safe, always safe? No. We could have begun a wonderful, passionate unity with God and then, through circumstances, allow the flesh to rise up, allow the world to entice us, the lives of the devil to deceive us. And we begin to walk in unbelief. Because when there is no obedience, unbelief is the next thing. So brothers and sisters, contending for a faith is walking in complete obedience to the word of God. Starting with what, command, what God commands in the word, in the written word. Being a strengthening the foundation of Christ Jesus and his obedience. And then begin to walk in obedience to the heard word of God, 
the spoken word of God as we mature. And so we continue obeying God in every aspect in which he communicates to us, even in the word he's giving us today. Because the people that were saved from Egypt were destroyed and died in the desert, died not in the promised land, died in the desert. They never made it to the promised land because of unbelief. There is a promised land before all of us in these last days. The promised land of the kingdom of God reigning with him for a thousand years under the power of his glory, in the power of his glory, with the power of his glory. Brothers and sisters, this is what we run the race, but what is set before us. Our destiny is to rule and reign with God, but will everybody rule and reign with God? God is letting us know the formula to carry that button of faith to the end and make it for our destiny. We can therefore boldly say that unbelief brings destruction because God destroyed all those that did not believe who have been saved from Egypt. Let's look at verse 6. And angels who did not keep their own first place of power but abandoned their proper dwelling place, were reserved in custody in eternal cha chains, under the thick gloom of utter darkness until the judgment and doom of the great day. So we see here that the angels who have a place in heaven, who have a call and a power in heaven, they abandon all that to come to the earth and unite themselves to flesh. But God reserved therefore all of those angels in dooms and darkness and in chains for the last great day of doom. Verse seven, the wicked are sentenced to suffer. Hang on, Pastor Stella, some might say. What about the suffering of the saints? What about the suffering of the apostles? What about the suffering of the martyrs? Yes, that suffering is for the perfecting of our soul, the perfecting of God's love in us, the perfecting of God's character in us, and also according to the book of Revelation, for our garments to become pure and white and, and clean. But the wicked are sentenced to suffer for eternity. Why I know this? Because it says here, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the advanced towns around them, which likewise gave themselves to impurity and indulged in unnatural vices of sensual perversity, and lay out in plain sight as an exhibit of perpetual punishment of everlasting fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah, they gave themselves to sensual perversity. We don't want to even enumerate them, but they are happening even in the church. They are happening everywhere. I know that many parts in the body of Christ have voted for this abomination according to the word of God, of sensual perversity that is against the, the solemnity of, of, of marriage. So how can God bless a nation when the church itself is cursing itself? I'm not judging anybody. The word does. I have nothing against anybody. For all I know, maybe those people have fallen on their knees, cry for with repentance for the Lord's forgiveness and have been restored to God. Hallelujah. May the Lord cause it to be. 
but it hasn't happened yet. I pray that the Lord's Holy Spirit will be like a mighty wind of repentance that will come to the hearts of those that have allowed themselves to be deceived by carnality and sensual perversity. And Sodom and Gomorrah are a perpetual exhibition of the eternal punishment that God's reserved for those that remain wicked, that will not change. This punishment is eternal fire. I call it hell, many does too, but it's eternal. There are all sorts of ministry going on around, but the Bible says it's eternal fire. It's not just temporary fire, it's eternal. Just like heaven is eternal bliss, eternal glory. There is a hell that is eternal fire. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in the Passion Translation, verse 4 and 6, it speaks of this and said, Now, don't forget that God had no pity for the angels when they sinned, but threw them into lowest darkness dungeons of gloom and locked them in chains where they are firmly held until judgment day of torment. Verse 5. And he did not spare the former world in the days of Noah, when he sent the flood to destroy that depraved world, although he protected Noah, the preacher of righteousness, along with seven other members of his family. Verse 6. And don't forget that he reduced to ashes the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, condemning them to ruin and destruction. God appointed them to be examples as to what is coming to the ungodly. Yet, he rescued a righteous man, Lord, suffering the indignity of the unbridled lusts of the lawless. Poor Lord, he really suffered while he lived with his children and wife in the midst of such a wicked generation. But is it that different nowadays, in the last days? When wickedness is pushed in the throat of the innocent? When evil and perverse sensual teachings are being pushed to be introduced as a legal curriculum in schools? Condemning, judging, mocking the young ones that know who they really are as God made them? Isn't it the same living in a society where now people who are who they are being born are cornered to avoid saying that they are either a man or a woman? What have we have come to? This is the environment in which we live. Sodom and Gomorrah, I suppose, is becoming lesser because many of those activities have been accepted as legal. And that is the greatest sin. But the worst of it all, since the body of Christ, the church of the believers, is supposed to be the government of righteousness in the nation that will give righteous leadership to, to the leaders of the nation, to the politicians, but what is the church doing? Bowing down to the pressures of Baal. Bowing down to the pressures of Jezebel. Bowing down to the pressures of Ashtaroth. Where is the righteous leadership unto our, our ministers, unto our politicians? These precious people could be helped by the body of Christ with righteous guidance, 
and prophecies. But no, in general, it's not happening. I'm saying in general, because I can't, I'm not pinpointing to any, any particular denomination. I'm talking to the body of Christ, the things that are going behind closed doors, the pulpit being defiled. with an anointing flowing from the pulpit of adultery, of immorality, greed. And the listeners and the people are being bathed by that anointing. This is what is causing God to be enraged with fury because of what we have allowed coming into the body of Christ. Okay, let's look at verse 8 and 9. It says, Nevertheless, in like manner, these dreamers, remember we read that men, not just men, men, just male and female, I suppose, but people coming in through the side door in the church, bring corruption, trying to deceive and, and, and get the immature drawn onto themselves, not to Christ, for their own gain. When these people, God calls them in verse 8, these dreamers also corrupt the body, scorn and reject authority and government, and revile and a scoff at heavenly glories or angelic beings. Have you seen any of these? Have you noticed people that will not take anyone to tell them what to do or not to do? That they will not submit to authority? I'm not talking about ungodly authority. I'm talking about godly authority. They will not. They will not because they are not in for Christ, they are in for themselves. And in verse 9 says, But when even the archangel Michael contending with the devil judicially argued and disputed about the body of Moses, which is in Deuteronomy 34, verse 5 and 6, he dared not to presume to bring an abusive condemnation against him, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. I guess we could all begin to adopt a little bit that manner of a speech when it comes to speak to, the, to our enemies. Because God says, love our enemies. Now that doesn't mean we have, to, uh, uh, we have to enter in their orgies. That doesn't mean we have to uh, sign in to their secret societies. That does not mean that we have to uh, lay down with a harlot just to show her that we actually love her. No, that doesn't mean that. To love our enemies is to pray for their souls. To love our enemies is to release the godly love of Christ that might redeem their souls. The, the prayers of the saints that are veiled much is not to kill deceive and destroy our enemies, but is to release them from the bonds and chains of darkness and bring them into the marvelous, bring them into the marvelous lights of Jesus, to catch them from the pit of darkness and the pit of fire. That is loving our enemies, to do good and overcome their evil. to do good. In the Passion Translation, verse 10 on the book of Jude says this, these people insult anything they don't understand. When I read that, I thought, this is a good thing for us to reflect in our own life. How many of us talk nonsense? We don't really know what is going on. We don't even know whether something is true or not true. We just blubber it out. Are we guilty of that? Well, some of us might be. And God is giving us this word to give us a chance to say, Lord, you're right. 
and I've been wrong all this time. Please help me. I repent. I turn away from my from these wicked ways. And I repent. I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to insult the things that I don't know, the things that I don't understand. They behave like irrational beasts by doing whatever they feel like doing. Have you been there? Have you experienced that? All around you, people that just will not in any way obey anybody, but they just want to do their own will. Have you experienced in your household fighting to have your way? Thinking that you know better than your spouse or or your mom and dad? And fighting and arguing and boasting. Have you behaved like that? God says that is ir irrational. So we need to repent. And continue saying, because they live by their animal instincts. They corrupt themselves. So this actually brings corruption. No wonder some of us you know, have difficulty seeing, hearing and everything because that corruption is like a veil of corruption that does not allow us to penetrate in the spirit realm because we are swallowed by the earthly realm of carnality, of living just to fulfill our own desires, our own will. Though the word of God tells us that we should endeavor to do the will of God, the way of God, for the pleasure of God. Ah. They corrupt themselves. And this implies that they are like beasts in heat. I don't know whether you have seen where we live in a rural area, so you can see very easily the beasts that are in heat. They are wild. They got to have what they got to have. And they bring about their own destruction. Well, not the animals, because they are given that instinct to procreate. But human beings that pursue their own will and their own ways are using that instinct to their own destruction. In verse 11, it says, Wow to them, for they have run riotously in the way of Cain. This is the way of Cain. They abandon themselves for the sake of gain. In the era of Balaam, or Balaam, and they have perished in rebellion like Korah. Three ways in which God illustrates this kind of conduct. Okay? Balaam and Korah. And they all wanted their own ways. Cain, well, Cain rejected the blood sacrifice that God desired for them to offer and gave the fruits of his own labor, his own work. Is that happening in the church? These false teachers, likewise, will insist in adding something to the gospel, taking something from the gospel, polluting it with their own human interpretation, reasoning, works. What was the sin and the error of Balaam? He was greedy. He was a prophet of God. He heard God. So just because we have the gift of God does not guarantee heaven. The fruits of the Spirit guarantee heaven, which the fruits of the Spirit manifest the character of God, the character of Christ. That's the guarantee to heaven. That's the guarantee to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. This precious man had an amazing gift. He even had a relationship with God, but he had not gotten rid of greed, the love for material things. And that way, he became an instrument to bring immorality into the people of Israel. At the end, God could not bless them because they have sinned. And 
Korah. Korah perished in rebellion. She, he rebelled against the authority of God in Moses. What? You know, sometimes, you know, have you noticed that sometimes we forget that a person is carrying an office and we either reject the person, judge the person, look down upon the person, but we do not realize that we are doing that to the office of God in the person. So let us be aware, if we have done that in ignorance, if we have done that, let us repent of that. Because going against the office of a man or a woman is going against the God that gave that office. It's up to God to judge through his word whatever goes wrong with any of us. But many of us indulge because we don't like somebody's way of dressing, way of speaking, mannerism, uh, and whatever else. And we're blaspheming God's ways. Let's look also in the Passion Translation at Jude 1 verse 12. And it says, These false teachers are dangerous hidden reefs at your love feasts, lying in wait to shipwreck the immature. Love feast. What is love feast? That's when we gather together as a body of Christ, having communion and rejoicing in the love of God, sharing the love of God in worship, in, in the preaching, in the teaching, in, in, in giving to one another. This is love feast. These people are false teachers and they come in into our love feasts and they look for the immature to deceive. They feast among us without reverence, having no shepherd but themselves. In other words, they will submit to nobody. I don't have enough time to share this, but I've known of a person with an amazing prophetic power, with an amazing call and knowledge of God, with an amazing fellowship with the spirit realm. But when pride came in, this person will hear nobody telling whatever God had to say. Nobody. Nobody could tell this person whatever God had given to tell this person. And finally, his great fall was that he would prophesy things that were not true, which I am witness of. They were totally not true, but he was totally convinced that they were. And this is what can happen. So it is not just for the immature. The immature can fall into that easily, but the very mature can fall into that as well. Pride is the love of self. Pride is thinking of ourselves more than others. And God says, think not of yourself more than you ought to, but look at others as better than yourself. Why does he say that? Safeguard from pride. When we go very high, we fall very hard. So God is showing us, no matter where we're at in God, Look, look back, make a count, check everything. Have you been there? Have you been experiencing a little bit of that? Have you been drawn onto that? Remember, those are the ways of the pit of hell. Those are the ways of the devil. Come back, come back, repent, that God may restore you and keep you running, fighting a good fight for your faith and winning against the powers of darkness that want you to go with him. He continues describing in verse 12, these people are clouds with no rain, 
swept along by the wind, like fruitless late autumn trees, twice dead, barren, and plugged up by the roots. What is God saying in this description? Well, the rain in the Bible uh, speaks, uh, like in Deuteronomy 32, verse 2, the rain is symbolizing revelatory knowledge. So these people don't have revelation from heaven. They have only their own reasoning. That's one of the signs. Amen. What does it mean, swept by the winds? Winds speaks biblically of spirits. It's not talking of the Holy Spirit. It's talking of other spirit. So when the Holy Spirit is not reigning in our life, other spirits could be interfering with our lives. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. We need to go, Lord, Lord, is there any thing that is leading me the wrong way? Is there anything at all, Lord? He is waiting for us. He is waiting for you and for me, for all of us to come. Humbly say, Lord, you are the greatest of all. You are a forgiving God. Please show me. Show me if there be anything at all in me that is offensive. Now in the book, in the Amplified Version, Jude 1 verse 18 says, While wolves, waves of the sea, sorry, waves of the sea, flinging up the form of their own shame and disgrace and confusion, wandering star from whom the gloom of eternal darkness and punishment has been reserved forever. Now, what does it mean by stars? It means these are false teachers that cannot be depended upon. The stars are used by the, the, the seamen to be guided to where they have to go. But these men are not dependable. They bring distraction, they mislead the people. In verse 14 and 15, it was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Behold, the Lord comes with his myriad of holy ones, ten thousands of his saints, I dare to believe not only he comes with his heavenly holy ones, but also through the earthly holy ones. Verse 15. For what does he come? He came originally like a lamb to save the world from sin, but he's coming like a king. And he's coming with the myriads of angels from heaven and through myriads of holy ones in earth. For what? Verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly ones, unholy ones, and who have done ungodly deeds and they have committed ungodly ways and of all the severe, abusive, offensive things which the ungodly sinner have spoken against him, the Lord. So there is a judgment coming. There is a judgment day coming. And we don't want to be under the punishing judgment of God. We want to take the assessing, assessment judgment of God right now through his word and allow his Holy Spirit to take over, to bring us to repentance and reconciliation and restoration with God that in the last day will be found pure and holy. Verse 16. This a hardened, chronic, habitual, addictive, compulsive, obsessive, murmurs, glamours, who complain of their own lot in life, going after their own desire, controlled by their own passions. Their talk is boastful and arrogant, and they claim to admire men's person and pay people's flattering comments to gain advantage 
and manipulate people. Wow, that's a mouthful. So here explains certain characteristics that represent these people. But there are powers and forces that influence mankind, even believers, if we are not careful, with some of the ways of these characteristics. And if we can recognize some of these characteristics wanting to enter in, wanting to take dominion in our life, we should take them off very quickly. For instance, murmuring, grumbling for what is a lot in life not happy with the way life has served us. Everything has a purpose in God and God's thoughts for us are for good, for not for evil, to help us and give us a future, not to hurt us. So if we are going through trials, tribulations, abuse, ill treatment, there is a purpose and we can always run to God. Amen. By complaining for complaining, Grumbling continuously. Have you been there? I don't know about you, but I have been until the Lord convicted me. No grumbling, no arguing. Live a cheerful life. Going after their own desire. Why do we complain? Because we want things done our own way. We want to have what we want. That's why the complaining. We want to have our own desire. <laughs> control my own passions. Oh, I want to be this kind of person. I want to have this kind of ministry. People that get jealous about somebody else's ministry instead of rejoicing and thanking God for what God has done in those people, they grumble and complain, why can't I have so and so and such and such power? Have you experienced that? Time to repent. Time to repent before it's too late. They talk boastfully. They're arrogant. I am better than thou. I know better than thou. I am more spiritual than thou. I have more visions than thou. Have you seen or have you ever experienced when, you know, I don't know about you, but I, confession is good for the soul. When I started having visions and dreams and all that, because nobody was telling me about their visions and dreams and all that, all I did is talk to, 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 to people about it and I was so excited about it and, and I thought it was marvelous. And because nobody was telling about their own experiences, I thought I was the only one. And that's how the devil begins to make you think that you are better than others, that you are more spiritual than others. And people go as far as thinking that they're better than the pastors. Intercessors, watch it. If you have a vision from the Lord or a revelation from the Lord, and he asks you to deliver it to your pastor, do it with humility and leave it in the hands of the pastor. Don't grumble and talk bad about him or her because they don't do exactly what you want them to do. Because by wanting to do that, by acting that way, you are doing exactly what these people are described in verse 16 of Jude chapter 1. Unless that no believer will use their position to go flattering others to take advantage and to manipulate them to do what they want them to do. If we have had that, that's common in the world. We all drank from the breasts of this world. We all had from the breasts of this world all that it teaches. Not all, but a lot of us. Some have been blessed to be born in a Christian family with Christian's background and righteous acts, but many, many, many have been born in the world with no Christian teaching. And when we come to the Lord, we have to learn it all and unlearn what we had learned before. If you're one of those and you still have some of these things that God is speaking of, tonight, come before the Lord and have a good talk to God. 
and go and talk to Jesus and ask him to help you with the Holy Spirit. Now, God is sending us with these scriptures also a call to remain faithful. Verse 17, 18, and 19. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions which were made by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18. They told you beforehand that in the last days, in the end time, there will be scoffers who seek to gratify their own unholy desires. Right? After their own ungodly passions. If you have anybody in your family, in your church, that is behaving that way, bow down your knees for them, repent on their behalf, cry unto the Lord God Almighty, who works in the hearts of men to will and to do what is God's pleasure, to work and soften their hearts so they may come into repentance and reconciliation with God. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. Don't condemn. Point the finger and start looking next week when you go to church or next time you go to church, start looking around whether you can find those that we have been talking about or the Bible has been talking about. No, 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 no. First look at you. And if you are clean, as God says, tells you, then pray for those that God shows you. Amen. You don't have to go looking for them. God will put it in your heart. Don't go judging people. Because you know what? Every one of us have the capacity to kill, to steal, to destroy, to deceive. All those ungodly things that the devil anointing gives to the people without God or without faith all have that capacity if not by the grace of God that trains us to walk holy life if it's not by the word of God that completes his love in us and his character in us we could be doing the same so who are we to judge one another let's not judge the people let us judge the action the action is to be judged amen let us evaluate the actions and then bring them before the Lord and ask for God's mercy. Amen. Because only God can change the hearts of man. No matter how much we talk, we can't change people. Only God talking maybe through us can change people. Talk, God talking through the Holy Spirit directly can change people. But we, in our own reasoning, cannot do. So we must stop trying to give sermons to one another. We must stop trying to give sermons in the family if it is not that says the Lord. If it is us looking continuously at the shortcomings. Rather than talk so much where the Bible says in the multitude of words sin is not lacking. Let us reduce the amount of words and bring forth more prayers. Amen. Verse 19. It is these who are agitators, setting up distinctions and causing divisions, merely sensual creatures, carnal, worldly-minded people, devoid of the life of the Holy Spirit and destitute of any high spiritual life. Desperately, they pretend to be highly spiritually. Desperately, seek to be highly spiritual, but they will not abandon carnality. So how can we serve two masters? We can't. Amen. So God encourages in verse 20, saying, By you, beloved, build yourselves. Build yourself. Lift yourself up. 
on your most holy faith. Fight for your faith and lift yourself up in that very faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and in the language of the Holy Spirit. Pray at all times in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the language of the Holy Spirit. And then guard and keep yourself in the love of God, in the love of God. Expect patiently the mercy of God in the Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. Refute, refute as to convict those that dispute against you. Have mercy unto those that waver and are doubtful. And take pity on others, but with the fear of God in your heart, that you may even loathe the garments that I spotted and polluted by sensuality. And the word ends up with giving all the glory to the Lord that says, now unto him who is able to keep able to keep us from falling a presenter's faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding exceeding grace with exceeding love triumph to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and sovereignty and dominion now and forever. Beloved, into eternity, God be exalted. And we are led by his love into eternity. And God in his great mercies give us a word such as this, not to bring us down, but to lift us up. So now, let us bow our heads and as the Spirit leads us, let us repent. Let us repent before the Lord of all carnality. Amen. If at all possible, wherever you are, just bow your knees physically. And if you cannot physically, for any medical reason, you bow in your heart before the living God. And have a talk to God. Talk from within your heart. As I lead you in prayer, you don't have to repeat these prayers, but if you are led to do that in your heart, you do so. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We thank you for your loving kindness and your mercy that through your word, Lord, you bring into us, Lord, the light exposing every darkness that is hidden within us, Lord. As we humble ourselves before your greatness, as we acknowledge, Lord, that you are the mighty one that created heaven and earth by your power and your stretched hand and by your word you framed the world. Nothing that was made upon the earth, it was made without you. Lord, we are your people. Lord, you made us in your image. But we ask you that through these words and many others that you are giving us for the conviction of your Holy Spirit, you lead us to repentance. You lead us to the restoration of our soul that we may become in your likeness. Just like you, Lord. Just like you, Lord upon this earth shining your truth, your brightness, your light and carriers of your glory because of the purity and sanctity that you require of us. Lord, we cannot make ourselves holy, but we come to you, the Holy One, in repentance that you will extend your hand upon us and make us holy. Father, we repent of all the carnality, all the wicked desires we learn of this world. 
nor for allowing in the church such corruption to come in. Forgive us, Lord, for falling man and not you. Forgive us, Lord Father, for our, in our ignorance, in our immaturity, Lord God. We gave preeminence to mankind more than to you, to the words of people more than to your words. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing us to be enticed by the cares of this world, distracted by the busyness of work, household, and everything else, rejecting your word. Father, forgive us for the boastfulness of pride. Forgive us for jealousy. Forgive us for being envious of other people's ministries and positions of blessings. Forgive us for murmuring continuously, for grumbling about the lot of our lives, for wanting our appearance to be different, for wanting our life to be different, to have our own desires fulfilled rather than yours, Lord. We thank you for your word that is convicting us. For you know, look, Lord, look at the tears of your people, those that have been touched and convicted by your spirit that they're crying out, yes, Lord, that's me. That's me that has been me. And Lord, I am tied up and I can't get out of it, but I believe that you can save me. Look at them, Papa. Look at them confessing, each of them, the things that you have shown them. Have mercy, Abba. Remember, oh God. Remember the bruising of Christ. Remember the weeping. In his back, remember. The piercing of his hand and his feet and his side. The blood that he spilled and the water there alone for the salvation of all of our souls. We thank you, Lord, for the honor and privilege to gather together today as one body. And not only today, but every day in which your work has gone forth from eternity to eternity, bringing forth the conviction of your spirit of holiness and life into us. For you do not deny that anyone should die, but that we should all live. Have mercy, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Some of us, Lord God, have done the very thing you said. Oh, praying on the immature and the babies in the church to build up our own ministry, to build up our own glory, to draw the attention to ourselves as the hero and not you who are the only hero of mankind. Oh, man. We have done so grievously against you and against you alone we sin. But remember, Lord oh God, that your mercies endure forever. Remember that your mercies triumph over judgment. Remember. Remember, Lord, that you have compassion in all that you have made. And that you will forgive, Lord, those that repent. Oh, Father, I pray, Lord, that the conscience of those that are crying out to you, Lord, be washed by the waters of the words we have heard that you have spoken to us. And every condemnation and every accusation and all the guilt the enemy have brought into our soul, our emotions, our thoughts, our will. 
be washed away by the waters of your word. And once again, Lord, let our memory be swiftly cleansed and purified from all the filthiness of images and sounds of words and actions, Lord, that defiled us and dishonored you. Sanctify with the oil of your anointing and the power of your blood. Cause our imagination once again be the platform of our fellowship with you and heaven. Sanctify our dream life and close the door of access to all the demonic influence in Jesus' name. And make us once again your chosen ones. Lord, by faith we consecrate ourselves to be set apart once again from the world, from the teachings of the world and the ways of darkness. For speaking nonsense and defiling our lips. Father, restore us back into your bosom of amazing love. Hold us fast unto yourself and teach us by your Spirit how to contend, how to fight for our faith against all the pressures of the wicked one in every area in which we live, Lord. And cause us to shine from this day forward the brightness of your light. Once again, let your written word perfect love in our hearts. Love for you and love for man. Pure and adulterated love. As we forsake the love of other things. Father, I help our ears to be open and all our senses, our spiritual senses to be activated that we may fellowship day and night with you, Lord, and be obedient, obedient followers of every instruction you give us. So we can say, it's not longer I who lives, but Christ that lives in me. Abba, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your character and your love and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for your desire that all may live and not perish. I thank you, Lord, for your desire that the nations be holy and the church goes back to the brilliance of your glory more than ever before. I thank you, Lord, because you who began the good work will complete it. I thank you for your covenant and your promise of salvation, redemption, Lord and restoration for your body of Christ. I thank you for the life of everyone that has been crying and is still crying before you, Lord. And I pray in the name of Jesus that as they are washed by the blood of the Lamb, their soul be loosed from the chains of darkness, that the mighty angel with a bow cut her will cut the chains of bondage to the world, the things of this world. That the victory crown of Jesus will put to shame as a display of defeat all the works of Satan that has been influencing all the saints that are now on their knees in their heart before you in repentance. And I ask you, Father, that you remember that you have said in your word to Israel that once you cause them to return to you they will never go away again. So I pray because we have been grafted as an olive 
the wild of a branch into the olive tree, that you will also gather to yourself everyone that has repented in this very hour, that they will never walk away from you again. And Father, wonderful, loving Father, we give you therefore our thanksgiving and all the glory and the honor and the praise and all your saints say, Amen. Dear beloved, I pray that you will have a wonderful week, that you will enjoy the marvelous presence of God in a far greater and deeper way than you've ever did. I pray that from this day forward you will go walk hand in hand with the Lord Jesus, covered by the mantle of his humility and his robe over you as a token of marriage, consecrated, living a sanctified life a holy life by keeping your faith. Today, in the name of the Lord, I bless you.